We come now to the final in our little series of four questions, important questions about life. And this is the one, where is everything going towards? That's a big question that many people don't really want to think about because they want to put off that, as it were. We don't want to think about what happens after our lives are ended on this earth. Most people try to live, and the word is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. So let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let's try to, as it were, avoid facing up to the reality of that future. The materialist, as we talked about, the materialist, the person who believes that there is only what there is here that you can see, that's what they think. There is nothing else. So, well, have a blast while it lasts. Of course, that's not a very successful experience because it often leads to so much pain and suffering and sorrow for individuals who do that, if not to themselves, to those around them. And this is a major question that everybody is going to face, at least in one form or other, if they're willing to be honest with themselves. In this pandemic that we have been living through with the millions of people who have died and the many, many millions of others who are left with a debilitation or other problems, these questions about what is the hope is there hope in this world? Is a massive question. And if, as Paul says to the Christians, if in this world only we have hope, he says we are more to be pitied than everybody else. For he knows that the Christian life is not an easy life. And that means for him, it will have been a life of trouble and sorrow if there's nothing beyond it. Now, maybe you remember when we went through Romans, and I must say it was one of the most interesting times for me to do Romans. I loved doing that series. We came across uh, these words there in Romans 8, and this is what it says in verses 19, or verse 18. I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, for in this we this hope we were saved. Hope, now hope, that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's marvellous words of affirmation. And whenever the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, which we thought about two weeks ago on Ascension Sunday, it's as though God pushed the pause button in some things. The Lord Jesus Christ will return. That's what the verses said, that why do you men of Galilee gaze into the heavens? The same Jesus whom you have seen go will come again in the same way. And when God lifts his finger off the pause button, everything will end. What we read about in Romans will all come to be in Romans 8 here. This is all, of course, dependent upon the glorious events that happened in the resurrection. And we did have some interesting times, didn't we, back when we were thinking about Luke 24 and John 21, when we were taking time to think about the reality of the resurrection. And I think one of the pictures for me that's most marvellous is not just the fact that Jesus has raised from the dead, which is a fact, an undeniable fact, and it's been researched and it's been examined from many angles, from those who are Christians and those who are not. And the overwhelming, the overwhelming conclusion is that this is the true detail. But in John 21, here we have this wonderful moment, and for me, as a, as a little moment to bring this present series of Side by Side to a conclusion, although I will have something special for tomorrow, just a little personal word, um, it is a very fitting place, isn't it? The disciples have gone off to fish, and they catch nothing all night. And then as the day, the new day is breaking, Jesus is standing on the shore, 
And his disciples can't just see who it is. And he calls out to them and he says, do you have any fish? And they say, no, no. And then he tells them to cast your net on the right side and you'll find some. And they do it. And then they're not able to haul in because the quantity of fish is so great. At that moment, Peter then recognizes, it's the Lord, he says. And when Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord he put on the outer garment for he had stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. And of course, when they all get to land, they see a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard and he hauled the net ashore. There was 153 large fish. And although there were too many, or there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus says then, now come, come to have some breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? I mean, they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This moment, I know it has been the same for others and I certainly resonate with their thoughts, that it pictures for me something of the future. Now, I don't think that heaven is a lakeside with a charcoal fire and Jesus cooking breakfast on it. No, that's not what I mean. But here are all the realities. Here is Jesus who has been crucified, dead and buried, and now raised. He meets with them in reality. He has fish. And one of the other disciples, in the other places we read, remember it says, he took some of the boiled fish and he ate it. So Jesus actually shared, not we're not talking about this time, but on the time he met the disciples in Luke 24, he eats with them. There are all of these physical things that are associated with Christ's resurrected body. And when the Bible talks about going to make a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell, I have, in my mind at least, this picture before me of Jesus and the disciples, this very real, the noises of the sea, the smell of the fish and the sounds of the fire cracking and the sizzling of the cooking, and the gentle murmur of folks gathering around and the quiet contentment of everyone after they have shared in this. I do believe firmly that the Lord will return and he will set in motion all of those things that the scripture has said will happen. There will be judgment. There will be glory. There will be reward. Just like the Apostle Paul spoke of it when he said that I have run the race, I've finished the course, and now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not only for me, but for all of those who have loved his appearing. And, and I take great comfort in this. The Lord has prepared things. That's what he said. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now he went to the cross. That's where his preparation took place. But he said, it's to prepare a place for you. And in that place, he will be there. And that will be glory for us. A future where, as in Revelation we are told, there is no sin, no sorrow, no suffering, and no death. We will be delivered not only from the penalty of sin, which we already have, and the power of sin, which we can rest under Christ to achieve, but we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. The very thing that makes all of the mess that we've been talking about throughout this week. That's your destination, that's your hope, that's your destiny as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you and I talk to our friends, we need to believe this. Because if we really believe this, surely we cannot be people who are half-hearted, mediocre, cynical, negative. People who have such a wonderful future ahead of them must be a people full of joy and enthusiasm and passion and zeal. I think this is a wonderful encouragement on the one hand, and it's a timely challenge to us. And I hope that you have found these four questions that I've tried to answer, and not in any great detailed way, but just to give you them as a framework so that when you and I are talking with our friends, there'll be something you can share. You'll have real content that you can bring scripture into around these four questions. Where's it all come from? Why has it gone so wrong? How do we put it right? And where's it all going to? 
And I trust that the Lord will bless you and give you joy as you enter into those discussions and his Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom you need. And tomorrow will be our final morning for a little while. And I've got, I think I'll have a few words of counsel, I hope, and encouragement. Okay, and God bless you.